Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, Hum by Verizon, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, Brian Robinson. Hello and welcome to MotorWeek podcast number 187. Uh, doing this with the B team once again as uh, John Davis is out there on the road. Skeleton crew today, uh, just online content coordinator Greg Carlos. I'm here. And Joe Lago. Also here. One of our uh, editors and podcast producer. Uh, we do a little things a little differently this time. We will give you a couple road test cars we've uh, been working on lately. Then get into some viewer questions. Uh, we got a that big you guys pile of sent them. in. So uh, yeah, we'll try to get through as many of those as we can. So uh, let's get right to the Dodge Durango SRT. Um, the first, uh, believe it or not, SRT version of the Durango after all these years. Uh, we've driven it, tested it. What, uh, what do we think about it? Yeah, it was always kind of surprising. It took that long to get in Durango SRT. And now that we have it, it's pretty awesome. Uh, super fast, super comfortable, super big. Um, loud. Very loud. People know you're coming. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot to like about it. Not as powerful as a track hawk, but uh, you have more space and still quite entertaining. Yeah, it has a 392 uh, Hemi. And you bring up the track hog. We actually say in our road test that many of us prefer the Durango to the track hog, despite that's guess, the Jeep Grand Cherokee track hog for the right. uninitiated. Yeah, uh, despite being down what 250 horsepower, maybe or not sure the exact numbers. Uh, why is why is that the case? Why do we prefer the Durango more? I think it's just more useful a little bit more tuned for the street more comfortable the track hawk to me was a little bit more frantic on the highway even though it's still a pretty good highway cruiser considering what it is the durango is just even better uh supple again you can carry a lot more stuff it's and a, you can fit it's an more suv you it. could drive every day sure you know not that you couldn't drive a track yeah. hawk every day but the the durango just is maybe a little bit it's like nine tenths you know of the way there yeah, the track hog definitely has more of a razor's edge to it, whereas the Durango, uh, it was softer, definitely more comfortable. And as great as it sounds, like as soon as you back off the throttle and that thing goes into eighth, it, it quiets down big time. Right, and I think, yeah, the the Durango has 475 horsepower. I think people forget that's still a ton of horsepower. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, you say, oh, well, you know, a, a Hellcat has, you know, 250 more horses. But really, like, do you really... <laughs> Is 475 not enough? Like, I, I thought it was more than satisfactory. Yeah, it felt fast. And I I like the fact that you're able, I think it still tows 60, 200 pounds, I think. Or maybe, uh, I believe that's the number. It might even be more than that. But they kept all, I know like when Ford did Lightnings and other, you know, high performance SUVs over the years, you know, it takes a huge hit out of their practicality. But Yeah, why does, a, when you do a performance trim level on like a truck or an SUV, where theoretically you're adding a ton of horsepower, why does that lower your towing rating? Do it just changes to the suspension and stuff? Yeah, I think the engine itself is so much harder on all the other parts. It's usually never a matter of engine. The towing ratings are based more on uh, frame integrity and rear ends and transmissions more than anything else. So when you're already overworking all that stuff with a bigger engine, you know, they don't want you to tow them much. I think that's more that than anything. Yeah. But they kept all the capability and made an awesome Durango. And it's funny. I think the SRT looks better, too, with the blackout trim and stuff because I compared it to – because I, I edited the road test for it, and I found I put a shot of a, a Durango Citadel, like the – you know, the not full-out luxury, but like a middle-level Durango. And it went with chrome and the chrome wheels and stuff. And I thought, boy, the SRT really looks better than the, the base or the other. I think the blackout and that sort of look with it, I think it really works. I think it gives new life to some body panels that are a little long in the tooth. Yeah, uh, agreed. Dodge doesn't do uh, too many boring things anymore. Moving on, uh, McLaren 570S Spider, the third vehicle to come in the sports series following the Coupe and the GT. Spider, of course, it means removable roof and supercar uh, speak. 
Uh, what did we think of that one? It's a pretty righteous car. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed driving it more so than I expected to. I mean, we get a McLaren come into our parking lot and you're like, well, this is a pretty spectacular car. It's not something we get to drive a ton. Pricing wise, I mean, we do, honestly, we get to drive cars that are that expensive. But when you see a McLaren with the way that uh, A pillar hinge doors come up, there's just an aura around it. And uh, getting inside of it, I mean, it's really, I'm a tall guy and it's pretty comfortable. Once you get in, of course, you know, getting in is, is one thing and getting out. But once you're in, you're fine. I was surprised at the road manners. It really wasn't that big of a deal to drive at an easy pace. That, yeah, that was something John Davis said when he was talking about it. Uh, he said that, yeah, I mean, on the road, it's a pretty well-mannered, comfortable, it's not a grand touring car, but Which it has have. it has a little bit of that sort of grand tour. Although he said, if you hit a pothole, it'll shake your teeth loose. For it's sure. like on a regular road, you're doing just fine, but you hit boom, and it'll just rattle your your brain. But yeah, it's, it is more similar to the GT than the coupe, so it has the additional sound editing, a nicer interior, uh, more storage space. I thought it was tricked the way the top worked. Like when you have the top up, you get open just the back part. And you have a whole lot of storage space back yeah. there. I thought that was pretty trick. But, it, I mean, yeah, you can't say it's too much. I mean, the car just drives so nice. It's it's almost like driving a Boxster around. It feels way smaller than it physically is and not uh, intimidating at all. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a lot like a race car. It's kind of Spartan probably isn't the right word, but very technical. It's like they don't go out of their way to make things look fancier right it's just like here's your buttons this is what this one does it's easy to tell small screen Um, i like the blue and orange yeah like mclaren has this personality and they don't get too far away from it like it or hate it that's who they are they're kind of like i would say more on the nerdy spec side of the spectrum when it comes to supercars performance cars um and again, back to just the comfort of driving it. There's a lot of fast cars that don't like to be driven slow, and this one was not that way at all. I mean, you can just cruise through a slow section of your town if you want to show off to people, and you're not getting bucked back and forth trying to cars get through it like coffee. below 30. Yeah, yeah. McLaren's done a really great job, and um, their sales are going crazy. So. Right, they seem to be expanding, yeah. which is will, usually a small boutique manufacturer like that. You always kind of wonder, are they going to be a death door next month? But they seem to be really making making money. Yeah. I will say, it's <laughs> in an era of so many turbocharged cars, this one's still like has the most turbo lag of any car we drive, right? Really? It's like, do they do that on purpose just because that's how turbos were up until, you know, a few years ago? Or I think it's definitely a personality. They want to maintain that personality. Because it's like you start off and there's nothing, and then that boost hits, and it's everything you've ever read about turbo lag. It just, like, <laughs> comes in and strikes you in the chest. Hmm. All right, let's uh, let's do this. Let's get, get to, to a bunch questions. of viewer questions here. We're just going to rip through them and get through them as fast as we can. Uh, starting from Jeff, uh, which company has the best self-driving tech, and do you like any of the systems for mind-numbing traffic slogs? I was just coming back in DC traffic in the BMW M5, and I did use their version of, I don't know what they call it now, but mm-hmm. um, radar cruise control, and it stopped itself. Up until a point, it would actually take off again. You know, if you come to a complete stop, as long as you take off within like a second or two, it'll do it on its own. Otherwise, you just have to press the gas. It's, you know, it didn't take long to get comfortable with it. The only thing I would say is that it's just a little aggressive on the brakes. But then again, it's an M5. You know, a computer can't even slow that thing down calmly. Right. Uh, yeah, I uh, I think Volvo has a good system. I drove a what was it? What's the sedan? S ninety sedan mm-hmm. with their pilot whatever. Pilot assist. Yes, uh, it was intervenes a lot more than just a standard lane keep radar cruise system would, but it doesn't. At least on my particular trip that I had it, it didn't seem to intervene in like a threatening or scary way. So Volvo's system is good. Uh, 
I've driven most all of them. I'd say for highway use, the Cadillac Super right. Cruise was definitely uh, it's a the league best. of its own. Stop and go traffic, which she's referring to. I think the Audi system uh, and the A8 and A6 did a super good job of uh, uh, stopping and starting uh, I mean, traffic. You have to mention autopilot because they did kind of pioneer quite a few things, and they are one. Tesla, you mean? Yeah. yeah. One of the few systems to actually change lanes when you put your turn signal on, which Super Cruise cannot do. Super Cruise, in my opinion, like you said, is probably the most impressive and does exactly what it says it'll do on the highway. It will not change lanes for you if you put your blinker on. But uh, aren't all Cadillacs going to have Super Cruise as an option soon? Eventually, yeah. yeah. All right, moving on. Do cars... Uh, with moonroofs get hotter in the summer because there's only a screen to block the sunlight. That's from Paul. We've never done like a thermometer test, but test. I, we could do I that would easily. assume you you can tell if you're driving on a really sunny day and you still have like the fabric sheet pulled over, you can still feel a little bit of sunlight on your your. Well, we had a stuff. BMW X1 long term, and more than one person complained about that very thing. They were on a long highway drive and sunny. And their head was getting hot from all the sun coming through. So yeah. uh, it's definitely that is definitely the Although case. I don't the nice, have any hard data for it, but the nice thing about moonroofs is you can leave them cracked in a parking lot to let out hot air while your car is parked. But yeah, if depending on the type of fabric they have to cover it up when it's closed, sometimes the fabric's not thick enough to block all the sunlight. Next from Larry, will you be reviewing the new Buick GS? We're thinking of buying one. And value your opinion. The Regal is that? Yeah, the Regal yeah. Grand Sport. Are we? <laughs> I would assume so. Yeah, I mean, I'd have to imagine it's out. I'm not it's sure. one of those things. Buick kind of it's out of dealers, but Buick didn't do do, do a huge push for it yeah. in the automotive journal. Some of it happens too. Like the Regal Hatchback was all new. We do that, and then we do the wagon version, the that's, Torx. See, that's what I was thinking. So it's of. like, yeah, do we want to do a third Buick? And that's so. I'm sure we will get around to it eventually. Uh, it just hasn't uh, happened yet. Uh, do we like uh, – this is from Bruce. No, read the question. <laughs> do your experts <laughs> do Thank your experts you, Bruce. like or dislike CVT transmission and why? Depends on what you're trying to do. If it's a performance car, it's kind of a joke. But if it's a daily driver well, – You wouldn't have one in a performance car except, I mean, WRX. Like, WRX. like, like Lexus weird. or something, <laughs> yeah. You, no but, one would want that anyway. But, I mean – if it's a daily driver, I drive a, Subaru, a 2015 Subaru with a CVT, and, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, uh, If you would have asked me maybe two years ago, I would have said absolutely dislike them 100%. But there's been a couple just recently that do a good job. The Honda Accord one I think is pretty fabulous. Uh, there's been another one or two. But generally, no. And mainly, if you do a lot of like merging on highways and stuff, just the engine noise gets incredibly annoying. That is the one thing I don't like about um, the Subaru system. Is yeah. If and you're really putting the pedal down, it kind of just does nothing. It gets like angry, but it yeah. doesn't go we, any faster. We, we actually had a question on Facebook, similar to this one. It was just asking why we don't like CVTs, because I think we do come off as disliking CVTs, but it's for that exact reason. They're loud. They don't offer the performance that we want as enthusiasts, but at the same time, I mean, and this is just since I've been here, they've gotten They've gotten much better. better. Yeah. And but I, they've been around for about a decade now. I mean, more, it's not more. new technology. I think, the, I think the average person gets into a car probably would not even be able to decipher which yeah. transmission I think in. the last problem area is the merging thing, like yeah. you said. Well said. Uh, Joseph asks, is the Dodge Charger getting a body style change anytime soon? I believe they're up for one. If it's time, all new, but right? they haven't yeah. said a lot. Yeah, it's definitely in the works, uh, but there's still some debate about what chassis it's going to be on. Since uh, It's going to be a Giulia-based thing? or Yeah, or Maserati even with the mm. new uh, – well, yeah. Um, or Alfa Romeo somewhere. I, I keep hearing all these rumors that FCA has all these designs in the pipeline, but they haven't launched them. Like, where's exactly. the Jeep truck? Yeah. Where's the Wagoneer? Where's the? It's just like they're. So I think it'll happen, Joseph. Uh, but we don't have any inside info as to when. When we know, you'll know. What's the best full EV with 100 plus miles of range? And what's the best PHEV? This one's with uh, no name, so I'm assuming Joe made this one up. No, the <laughs> the guy had a uh, he wrote an email to us, but he didn't give us yeah. his name. It's just like his email address, yes. and I don't want to put How that you know out. Who was the guy? 
Fine, I don't Just the, assuming, the, Joe. The individual. Mm. Well, we've just got fired, all of us. Anyway, what's the best EV out there? Oh, man, we could talk about this for a whole podcast. I mean, yeah. it depends what he wants. If he only wants 100 miles of range, you're talking Leaf or, you know, the. you guys all love the Kia Soul EV, but I haven't Dude, driven I don't that. Think that. Does that get over 100 uh, miles? Maybe like 95. So. It's close it's just to under. Yeah, I, I see still kind of... We did. I haven't driven an iPace. You drove. The I drove the iPace. iPace so I think you got to go take yeah, that. Yeah. It's definitely the best one I've driven to this point. Better yeah, than that's any not Tesla. Tesla. You yeah, have. Uh, better anything that's not Tesla. Put it that way. I would say Tesla still. I think you have to okay. default give yeah. it to Tesla because yeah. as much as we've been giving Elon Musk flack the last couple of months, I mean. The, they still the build reality cool cars. Is, yeah, it's still a very good. EV. But if if you're talking on the Mainstream, cheap end, if you're ta- if yeah. you're talking cheaper EVs, I, I like Leaf. the e- I like Leaf. I like the E Golf more than I like the Leaf, uh-huh. the Volkswagen E Golf. That thing is that thing's fun. And then plug-in hybrids. Plug-in, yeah. Just go listen to our last podcast. We had yeah. a viewer question about that. Mm-hmm. So. I mean, Almost everything now you can get a plug-in version of it, or will be able to soon. I will say I was surprised with the Pacifica plug-in. I was oh actually goodness. able to get a lot of my commute done in one battery charge. That was cool. And that thing has serious oomph if you yeah. need it too. Oh, yeah. So I missed it. The only, the only problem is, is you when you do get the plug-in hybrid, you lose the ability to go stow and go, right? Which is actually a big deal for a lot of people with minivans because the second row is where the battery goes. Yeah. But yeah, the Pacifica plug-in is definitely well executed. It's kind of like a car that needs a little more uh, press. We got how are we time wise? We can keep rolling. Uh, yeah, you got seven minutes. All right, let's go. Uh, electric cars gaining in popularity, automatic transmissions getting better by the day, the increasing integration of safety features. Is there any way the manual transmission can survive? This from Jimmy. That's dramatic. Mm. I mean, I think it will. Just if it's possible, it'll get even less, less popular. available. Be than like it is point right now. one one point zero zero one percent of the, the market. The truth is, is we just don't need them anymore, and we the, love the them, but we don't need them. It. It's getting harder and harder to make a case for them. It's, just a, it's a horse that. whip kind of thing, yeah. right? Like, but it's, what it was it? The Civic Type R? That's manual only, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's still quite a few so, manual-only cars. Yeah, I think they'll they'll survive, but in extremely limited yeah. tasks. Um, wow, uh, Cheryl has an issue. Uh, it's uh, too long to read all of it. She doesn't like the fact that fuel doors on her vehicle are on the passenger side. She thinks it's unsafe. Why can't it be on the driver's side? Uh, right, are, concerns about filling up gas late at night. You're on yeah. the opposite side of your car. Somebody can climb in or that sort of thing. Well, uh, I think it just comes down to packaging, yep. and I think a big reason most American cars and most cars designed for America put them on the passenger side was that— In Europe, they'd be on the driver's side, right? Well, that when you ran out of gas and you had to stand alongside the road and pour gas from a gas can in your car, you wouldn't be in traffic. You would be uh-huh. opposite of traffic. See, I thought, I it, was, was, I thought it was because in, in Europe, like, you would— You'd, it would be on the driver's side, and they're just European models that have been Americanized, but they can't reroute the gas line. Yeah. So, so uh, sorry you feel unsafe, but it's, it really just comes down to packaging at this point. Um, Floyd uh, wants an Accord, <laughs> but there's no longer a V6. He refuses to buy turbos. Uh, he doesn't think turbos have the reliability of V6s. Uh, what do we say about that? We were talking about this before the podcast. There's diesel semi trucks on the road that have turbos with a million miles on them. I mean, granted, they're built more heavily than a Honda Accord, but he, his concern isn't with the engine or the engine block. His concern in the email is with the actual turbocharging unit. I mean, I, I don't know what more evidence you want. There's lots of yeah, diesel too- trucks, diesel pickups, diesel cars that have had turbos for 30 years and they last 200,000 miles, you know? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure they were saying this when they were using those turbos in the 80s but it's 2018 and we are pretty good at building turbos at this point we've been doing it for a while and we certainly drive a ton of them and if if they were blowing up on regular basis we would be hearing about it for sure and <laughs> yeah. we just aren't especially with ford and their EcoBoost stuff uh, at yeah. this point. i think they would they did have some fire problems with that one point six liter or whatever but yes i think they got that straight yeah out. moving on start tech uh, from David, start stop technology may save at the pump, but does it cause battery drain? Are there problems in cold climates? Uh, David wants his engine running all the time. 
in what case of a zombie st- apocalypse. What do we think about Stop Start? I can certainly uh, sympathize with you there. I did not like Start Stop, and I still don't love it. There's a lot of cars that don't do it well, but there are quite a few who who do uh, start and stop pretty seamlessly. So I don't have a problem with that, and I've even gotten used to the idea of sitting there and not wasting fuel. So I understand where you're coming from, but uh, again, they uh, they've kind of solved problems with this too. I don't it's well I don't, tested. I don't particularly care for it, but I to answer his question about battery life, it's such a small drain on the battery. I mean, you're still the motor is still running and turning the alternator like eighty percent of the time. Right. It's worth noting it's not a traditional starter in there. They have a bunch of heavier right. uh, duty things to get the car started. Um, I guess that's about all we have time for. Yeah, uh, we're coming up here. That one. <laughs> thanks for sending in your questions. Uh, we should do we this again some sometime. Answer. All right, let's do that. <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> Send us more questions. <laughs> Send us your questions. Uh, We'll just wrap up by thanking our audio engineer, Jim Bigwood, podcast creator, uh, Bob Mixter, and, of course, Joseph, our producer. And uh, just remind you to tune in on uh, PBS and on Velocity Network and uh, the Internet. Check us out all over the Internet. PBS.org slash MotorWeek. Thanks for tuning in. (laughs) You've been listening to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com, WeatherTech, Hum by Verizon, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.